Well, welcome, Ben. It's nice to see you. And hopefully this will be the first of, you know, many meetings in which we will. Oh, uh, I will be here. Which we'll sure. have you. Great. Without a note. Great. Without a note. Without a note. Okay. Any other comments, announcements, questions before we get moving here? Seeing none. Okay. Uh, I want to introduce, um, again, a great friend of our chapter, Ryan Divish, writes uh, about the Mariners, writes about baseball for the Seattle Times. He's done it for a number of years, and he can fill us in on the details of how long he's been doing it now. But he's been meeting with our chapter for at least the last seven or eight years, you know, every every year to tell us what we need to know about, um, you know, the, the Mariners. And, you know, here we are in December, so we'll get a hot stove update. Um, Please again mute yourself if you are not asking a question, but otherwise you can raise your hand. Or in the past, I know that you've entered chat um, questions into the chat box, and Ryan can just burn through those. I think last year he talked for like an hour straight, and everybody just put questions into the chat box. Maybe having a you know actual back and forth might be better. But I will leave it to our members to decide what you are more comfortable with in asking questions. I'm sure you have many questions, um, so I'm going to stop talking, Ryan. How are you? How are things in your neck of the woods? And then I'm sure the questions will start and won't stop for you know the next hour or so when I will probably have to cut us off and, and move on. So welcome. Good evening. Hope you were well. Uh, thanks. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, let me check here what it says here on my Apple Watch. It is six degrees here in Haver, Montana with the wind chill putting it below zero. I have shoveled snow for the last two days. Um, so I, I spend my my time here in Montana in the off season hanging out with my girlfriend. Um, and it's kind of my reality check, which is a good thing for me. Uh, the season went a little bit longer than usual. Usually I'm home by October 1st or 2nd, and it went a little bit longer than usual because they made the postseason. And this was the first time I cover the postseason. Uh, in all my years of covering professional baseball, I started covering the Mariners in some form or another back in 2006 uh, for the News Tribune in Tacoma. Uh, kind of moved up the ladder at the News Tribune to more full time status and then um, went to the Times, I think, 14. So, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I love, I love doing the, uh, the meeting. It's always a little more fun when it's in person than the Zoom, but, you know, this allows me to do it and not have to be back in Seattle. Um, so, you know, let's just uh, fire away. And Matthew saying that he hopes there is an announcement sometime during the meeting. That's no, Matthew, that only happens when I go play basketball or go to the gym or have something going on with my girlfriend when something like that happens. So, but let's uh, go ahead. I don't care how you guys want to do it. If you guys just want to ask the question or whatever, or tip, if you want to monitor, like people raise their hands, that's fine too. I don't care. Feel free to unmute yourself people and just ask questions. I'll start though, because I've already unmuted. So Ryan, what, um, what do we, what was the Mariners plan with Kyle Lewis? It felt like he got a, brief look this year he got hit in the head with the, the 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 pitch and then it was like exiled to the minor leagues and now he's gone so was he just not part of the plan here what what happened there yeah I think the big thing with Kyle was um I guess they uh, availability I, I think they looked at their roster uh coming up for this year and they just didn't see where they could have a full-time DH that didn't always wasn't always available to DH. I mean, the, the one thing about a DH is, is you want them to be available, you know, for 150 games. And what they found last year anyways, was that Kyle, because of the knee issues that he's had, um, simply just couldn't play three days in a row, even if it was all DH days. Um, the knee, which, you know, I think he's had three, at least three, there, you know, there are rumors of a fourth surgery, you know, PRP shots and all this different treatment, trying to get it better. I've been told that it's bone on bone, essentially, that he's got a 65 year old man's knee in one side of his body and it's the power leg that he pushes off of. And, and so I think had Kyle had a year where one, he was hitting with any sort of consistency and play, it was just available to play a little bit more. And you can predict like they, they had no problem like scheduling out days off as maintenance days. But what was happening was, is that 
that he'd play, you know, he'd have a day off and then he was supposed to play the next day and he'd come in and say, no, I can't play. It's still sore. I need an extra day. And that would kind of mess up the planning and guys, I think teammates started to get a little frustrated as well. And I mean, it just really is kind of sad um, because when you watch him when it's right and it hasn't been right very much at the big league level anyways, but when it's right, it's really just a pretty baseball player to watch. I mean, like just long and rangy and, you know, like, you know, kind of like, I mean, he's not as tall, but like how Dave Winfield used to move on the field, just long and everything was just smooth. And, you know, and really, if you look at the 2020 season, it was only about four weeks of where he was really, really good. He just wasn't as bad as some of the other guys that fell off. So it's, I I know that the Mariners are frustrated, you know, and it's such a fluke injury and it just never allowed him to be the player he was. And I think with the Mariners this year, they looked at their roster and just said, look, we can't you know, this guy's going to make some arbitration. He's arbitration eligible. I, he had some minor league options, but I, he was getting up on that service time point where he could have refused the options. And I think they just didn't want to deal with it. I think they felt that, you know, give Kyle an opportunity to go to a team where maybe he can just play all the time. I mean, the Mariners are playing for something this year, so they can't really, you know, let roster spots where guys are trying to prove themselves again. They needed to kind of look at, or hopefully I think their plan is to add to the roster uh, and and fill that spot with a bat that's going to contribute on a more regular basis. I'll just I, there's some here that I can just read here. Um, oh, Timothy asks, how much did you enjoy the Mariners 2022 season? Um, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, you know. <laughs> when they um lost so it was in what was it june what was it june 9th, 18th they were 22 and 32 i think or whatever it was or 23 i can't remember they were 10 games under 500 and i just i was talking with my girlfriend on the phone and she was she said, oh this is a playoff team they'll they'll rebound they're gonna make the playoffs i was like you don't understand they're 10 games under 500 they're seven or eight back for the third wild card i was like this team and i was like and they're, and they're not getting better. Nothing I've seen. And so I, she goes, well, I bet you they're going to make the postseason. And I said, okay, I'll bet you. And she's been trying to give up soda. And I said, well, if you, if you, if they make the postseason or I go, if they don't make the postseason, you have to give up soda for two weeks, cold Turkey. And she says like, well, fine. Well, and then you can give up drinking for two weeks. So she hasn't held me to that. She likes the idea of being right. And not me being wrong more than anything, but like, I, I couldn't believe that run they made starting on June 20th. I mean, they went, I think, 28 and three over that stretch. I mean, they won 14 in a row. You know, one of the games they lost was the brawl game when all those guys were suspended, Winker, Julio, JP, they never lost the game, which is stunning. Um, and, and that's how they did it, you know, and what they did was bank enough wins during that stretch that it helped them withstand some slow stretches that they had even in late September when things got a little tight, but it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, like I really, um, I like a lot of the guys on the team, like this team, you know, my first year really truly covering every day was 2008 and that was a tough team. They had Richie Sexton and Jeremy Reed and Jose Vidro and, you know, Eric Bedard and they just, they weren't likable guys at all. And they weren't very good baseball players. Um, this team is very likable. You know, like I, I really like Hanniger, um, love Ty France, you know, Cal Raleigh, Julio was great. Uh, Suarez. I mean, like a lot of those guys were a lot of fun. So that made it more fun because they were an interesting group. They had fun playing together um, and then they played good baseball. So it was definitely cool. As for like the postseason aspect of it, you'll have to like, so Ben from Canada, when we had to go, like, we didn't know where we were going to go and it was starting to get tight. And yeah. so what we really decided to do was um, because we didn't know whether we we're going to have to go to Toronto or Cleveland, we decided we, and you know, getting into Cleveland on a direct is impossible just about at that time we needed to take a red eye out for that Wednesday game or whatever it was. So we, we just decided we were going to take a red eye to Detroit. We're going to book a red eye to Detroit and go from there for multiple reasons. Cleveland's like an hour and a half from Detroit, really easy drive, much easier airport to maneuver. And then because Adam Jude, you know, let his passport expire during the pandemic, he could not get into Canada unless he drove in. So we, 
we, Larry Stone and I all, we just decided we were going to rent a car and go from wherever. So we ended up driving from Detroit um, through Southern Ontario into Toronto. And it was like a three and a half hour drive. Might've been even shorter had there not been traffic in Toronto, but it was scenic and it actually worked out better instead of the hour and a, or the, you know, there were guys that were missing flights at customs trying to get out of Pearson airport because it's just a madhouse in there. We were through the border in 90 seconds. So the drive was scenic. It actually worked out for the best. I mean, we went from Toronto to Houston, back to Seattle, just kind of crazy. It was crazy travel. You're writing, but like, and you're exhausted physically, but at the same time, like the adrenaline of covering playoff baseball and the intensity of those games, it really was unique. And it was a lot of fun. I really had a blast covering it. And I mean, like, you know, it was, I can see why, you know, I, I looked at my buddy Chandler who covers the Astros and I said, I, now I know why you're getting tired of this because of the fatigue and you're so used to this. But for me, this is new. This is pretty cool to cover. So uh, that's kind of what my season was like. I had a blast otherwise. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, okay. Why am the am signing Michael Conforto? I don't know. I honestly, I know they met with him. They met with Boris about him. Um, you know, they, they need another outfielder. They prefer to be right-handed. I, I think they're kind of waiting. I think Conforto is kind of waiting as well. Looking to see where the market is. Um, you know, there, there's still a couple outfielders with Nimmo finally signing for a ridiculous deal. Um, I think that stuff will start to go. I do think the Mariners might prefer to go the trade route. They have a couple of guys they've looked at, you know, obviously I've written about Brian Reynolds. They still have interest in him. I know they've checked in with the availability of Tyler O'Neill. Um, maybe bring him back. I mean, could you imagine a, a platoon of uh, Jared, Jared Kelnick and Tyler O'Neill in the outfield? It'd be like Hans and Franz from Saturday night live. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I, I think it's all about what Michael's asking for and kind of how he would fit. Um, and he certainly wants to go to a place where he can play a lot. And I don't know if that's going to be the Mariners or not. Uh, was Hanager 100% the last few months of 2022? Yeah, he was, um, you know, but what he, he kind of admitted his, his timing was just off. He just kind of got, um, um he, he admitted just like was out of sync if you ever look at Hanniger's swing it's got a huge leg kick the huge bat wrap and so when he gets off out of whack even just by you know half a second or whatever it can really mess with him and I think that was the biggest thing that that he was talking about USS Haver named, <laughs> named after Haver Montana I'm, I mean it must specialize in going through ice in uh cold weather if it's named after Haver, Montana, or wind. It's like the windiest place you ever hear. Um, do you think Hag Haggerty could have made a difference in the Astros series? Yeah, I think I do. I think just you get him on base, you know, you use him as a pinch runner. If you remember, you know, they pinch ran for Suarez uh, in that game, and it was with Dylan Moore, and they actually had opportunities to pinch run earlier, but they didn't have Hanniger, and they had the kind of the one guy. I, I think, yeah, you could have um, – they could, he could have helped them. I mean, they had to play Jared against – they had to play Kelnick against a lefty, I believe, in that. Start him against one of the lefties, and that didn't help him either. Uh, would Will Myers – I mean, he might be. I, he's not a very good outfielder. Will Myers isn't. Um, you know, I don't know what the money left is, um, but I don't know. I, I don't think he's a game changer, but is he a fill-in over a replacement level player? Yeah, probably. But I, I do think they'd rather if they're going to settle for Will Myers, fine. But like they have their like for, in talking with sources, like if they're going to make a move, um, they really want it to be for an impact guy. You know, they would trade Kelnick or maybe Emerson Hancock to get a an impact impact guy, a real as as they call it, a dude, not just a guy. There's some thought that Will Myers is kind of just a guy anymore, that he's aged out. You know, he'll hit a homer every once in a while, but maybe not the guy that's going to help you. And I, I do think they're conscious of defense in the outfield after seeing Winker this year. And, and, you know, they, you know, you have Teoscar at Hernandez, who isn't the greatest defensive outfielder. He's better, but you know, that's, that's an issue as well. What does your search say? It says ban the wave. I got this from uh, 
Roto gear, yeah. Ban the wave. And so I don't know that people agree with me, but I thought it was funny. Somebody got it for me. Let's see here. Do you think Julio Rodriguez is mature enough to avoid us? Do I think Julio Rodriguez is mature enough to avoid a sophomore slump? Um, absolutely, because I think he's mature enough to have decided that he was going to exceed the Mariners' own expectations for him and make the opening day roster out of spring and make it as a center fielder like the Mariners never told Julio hey you need to get faster you need to trim down so you can play center field Julio decided look I have a chance to play center field and start there so I want to do that and he did all the work himself the Mariners never asked him to to do any of that stuff his his team with with Octagon Agency and his reps they decided hey look you know, if this is what the kid wants to do, and I think he got his eyes opened a little bit when he played in the, the Dominican Winter League and struggled, you know, he reassessed everything and said, okay, I'm not as close as I thought I was to being where I need to be, so how do I do this and cut cut the gap? And that's what he did. I mean, like, he did the speed training and all that on his own. So that's why I think, like, that kid is so driven uh, for towards success, and he's so competitive competitive and he loves playing baseball so much like all that stuff all the work and stuff it doesn't feel like work to that kid and so I think he he truly he truly likes doing it so I don't see a slump um I don't think he's going to see as many fastballs as he saw this year and he didn't see a ton but I, I bet you he'll hit curveballs just fine um Michael asks if there's an off-season podcast Michael we've been trying Larry got COVID for a while and that made it difficult and and then I just timing of it all and trying to match up like, like even today we were going to do a podcast today and then the Mike Leach news broke. And so Larry had to write that and, you know, Adam's doing stuff. I know that Adam is going to help out more this year with baseball. We feel like baseball's kind of moved to the forefront a little bit. So he's going to do more stuff, which is good, but we just can't, I'm hoping to do it maybe tomorrow. I got to check with Larry and those guys and see what their schedule is. They're, they're working a lot harder than I am right now. Mm. If the Mariners had not let go of their league in game one against Houston, do you think they would have made the difference? Oh, if they win that game, I think that changes everything. I just think the whole tone of this series, and it's not just that they lost, but it's how they lost it. You know, it's like Robbie Ray gives up the bomb that still may be going. And frankly, it wasn't even the longest homer Jordan Alvarez hit in that in the postseason, but he gives up the bomb and it was just so disheartening and they said all the right things. And I think they truly believed it, but that was such a gut punch that, you know, it's tough to recover. And I think, you know, and they were in the other games, but I think if you win that and it pushed a level of pressure on Houston that they didn't, you know, I don't think they felt in a while and they didn't feel a whole bunch. They certainly didn't feel in the Yankees series. So I think, you know, and the Mariners matched up with them. Well, I think that would have changed a lot. I certainly, you know, because if you come out of that series or if you come out of that, the first two games and you split one, one, that's ideal. You take the first one and they had chances to win the second one. You find a way, maybe ride a little momentum, take the second one. I mean, it just changes everything. And I think, I think if the Mariners had played the Yankees, they would have kicked their ass because I just feel like the Mariners, the Yankees just didn't match up well with the Mariners. Okay. Steve asks, is Kelnick genuinely disliked by his teammates? Um, no. Um, I think people probably have heard some stuff that I've said on the radio about who teammates didn't really like on the team. It wasn't Jared Kelnick. I think there are guys that don't understand Jared. Um, the intensity, you know, the broken bats, the helmets, just the, the sheer just kind of um, – like everything about Jared when he plays that game is so intense and so just like work, you know, I wouldn't say it's like him having a colonoscopy. He treats it like that, but it, it's, it's, it's work. Like he's attacking it. Like it's, he's attacking it. Like he's at work and there's a deadline. And um, I just don't know that, you know, I think when you're that intense all the time, it wears on teammates. So I don't think they always understand him. And I mean, really, I'm sure Jared probably hasn't shared a lot about his upbringing or anything like that. But, you know, there's reasons why he's kind of wound so tight. I do think it was better at the end of this year um, when he came back. He was a little less uptight. I think he understood, like, 
you know, I'm back. I better enjoy this, you know, and, and I think that's been a big thing for him. So no, I don't think he's disliked. I just think he's kind of misunderstood. I think they do like him, but like when somebody says like, Jared's great to talk to as long as you're not talking to him about baseball, because even when he talks about baseball, that intensity that he treats the game with is there in every conversation, you know, whether it's advice or the future or attacking a pitcher, like that intensity always comes out. And it's a good thing in a way, you know, and I think you have to have guys with that edge, but like, you know, he's still got a lot to prove. So I think that that's part of the problem. Um, did the Mariners front office feel they had to get rid of Jesse Winker? I don't know if they felt like they had to, but I think they were pretty motivated to, if possible. You know, the Mariners kind of have, and the service talks about it, an expectation level of how you're supposed to prepare on a daily basis and a, and a way you treat the game and a way you compete. And it just didn't mesh well. And whether it was due to the injuries or not, I don't know. I mean, like some people say it is, other players say it didn't. I do know that he had rubbed some players the wrong way. And it wasn't just like the preparation stuff, just some of the stuff, the way he went about his business and stuff, they just didn't like, you know, and, you know, if you're going to have a guy that's playing all the time, you need total buy-in. I think also like, if you look at kind of how he plays other than the bat tool hit tool, which we don't know for certain is going to return or not. Um, you know, he's not good defensively and they don't want to have an every everyday DH. So, you know, the roster versatility that they want just isn't there with him. I won't be surprised if he hits when he goes to Milwaukee. I mean, like if you think about the NL central in terms of hitters parks, and I don't know what the, I haven't looked at the part factors, but like Milwaukee is a pretty good place to hit. Uh, it's indoor, you know, closed roof a lot, it's just human. It's a pretty good place. Cincinnati, obviously, you know, Pittsburgh to a left-hander isn't bad. Chicago, you know, there were better parks to hit in there. So I think he struggled immediately when he saw that balls he thought he'd hit out in Cincinnati were not even close to going out. And I don't think he reacted well. Like, I don't think he reacted well to the pressure of being a guy that was supposedly the centerpiece of the trade and just kind of, I don't think he reacted well to what the status quo was at the Mariners about how you're supposed to attack each day. Like Mitch Hanniger is the perfect example of how you, you, you approach each day. You do the lifting, the workouts, the, the video, the meetings, all that stuff. You do it every single day to get ready to play. And if you're not playing well, you do a little bit more. And he just wasn't that guy, you know, and when everybody else is like that and you're not, that tends to rub people the wrong way. And I think um, that what kind of really um, started to frustrate players at the end was he just wasn't really, um, like so like the the double header even with the neck issue he was supposed to you know he hadn't gone on the injured list yet he was supposed to play in the the nightcap of the double header and then said that he couldn't right before you know like i think the seventh inning of the first game he went to the trainer said look my neck bothering me i can't play well that meant that adam frazier had to play the next game as well you know and they're they're going into the playoffs he just played frazier had to play 18 innings i think he said he slid five times you know he was relying on that off time and so like things like that start to build up, you know, availability, not, you know, and, and I think pitchers finally had gotten tired of the, the misplays in left field. I mean, if you that one in that one game, you know, Penn Murphy is trying to keep his ERA down and Winker misplays that ball in left field and the next guy with two outs and the next guy hits a three run bomb. You know, that hurts Penn Murphy, you know, and like it bothers him. So things like that, I think were issues. And I just think like, if you can make a move, and you feel like you're going to address a different need and get rid of a player that you didn't know how he fit unless he was playing at optimal levels. I think that's a smart move. I don't, I don't necessarily believe it's addition by subtraction, but it's a removal of distraction by subtraction is a good way to put it. Uh, why was Robbie Ray brought in for game one relief? I think it was just to boost his ego. I, I mean, I don't know that. Robbie thinks if you ever guys if you guys have seen the TV show Yellowstone, Robbie thinks he's Rip from Yellowstone, like just a bully and out there. I mean, did he get humbled a lot this season? Yeah, but I don't I don't know that it was to boost his ego. Sometimes, like I've accused Jerry and Scott and their staff of trying to show people how smart they are um, by doing crazy stuff. 
I don't know. Like when he came running out, I was just like, you got to be kidding me. And I told him, I'd, I'd written all the stuff about how they're going to, you know, they're going to pull off the stunner and, and be Verlander. And I'm like, I looked at Larry Stone and I said, I got, I got a bad feeling about this. And Larry said something like, I've got a terrible feeling about this. And so I, I opened up a new document and started writing. And what was crazy is I had written kind of a slimmer lead. I'd written a whole lead about Robbie Ray being terrible in Toronto and fans chanting his name and everything. And I had to change all that, but I had to change that one too. And so, um, yeah, I can't like, you know, you, you can look at the, you can get real, you know, into the numbers and say, yes, like Alvarez doesn't hit sinkers from lefties very well, you know, and, and look at the percentages and all that and the hard hit rate. But like he didn't even throw good sinkers. That's the thing. Like there was no conviction behind those pitches. It just was a bad spot to put a guy that isn't a reliever in there. You know, maybe they were feeling themselves because they did that with Kirby, but you know, and they didn't really, you know, I guess they had Boyd and they were worried about Bregman and that came back to bite him as well. But I just, of all the things you're going to get beat on bringing a starter in to pitch to the best hitter on the team. And that starter has gotten his teeth kicked in the entire year by that team. I just think, I don't care what the numbers say, just bad. It's just bad. Like don't do it. Um, okay. Has Ian Happ come up in trade rumors? I don't know about recently. They checked in on Ian Happ at the um, MLB trade deadline and the ask was too high from, I don't, I don't know what it was, but I think it was, you know, Kelnick and a couple guys for a guy that's, you know, you'd only have for two years. And a lot of people don't know if this is kind of a outlier year for him or not. Um, but some people were complaining that they thought they were going to get better, that the Cubs are just asking for too much. It wasn't just the Mariners. I'd heard it from several teams. So, and I know that there were some, people within the Cubs on the Cubs organization on the lower levels that were so frustrated that they didn't trade Contreras and they didn't trade Hap at the deadline and that they were asking too much because they just felt like they didn't, that the ownership had no real intention of keeping either. And so, you know, that maybe they'll try and trade Hap again this year and they won't get nearly as much because it'll be a rental. Uh, thoughts on the Teoscar Hernandez move for them. Um, yeah, I mean, I was kind of surprised by it. I didn't know that Hernandez was really available. I guess if I, I didn't really pay attention to his, you know, that he was going into the walk here of his of his um, club control and everything else. But yeah, I, I think when he's right, when he's healthy, he's pretty good. I mean, like the all-star season, maybe the, he's not going to put up those all-star numbers here. Um, park factors and all, you know, and the ALE is pretty good place to hit. But I mean, I think he's, he's a quality player. He's a right-handed bat. They need him. He's essentially a replacement for Mitch right now. Um, you know, and, and he's, he's proven to be a little bit healthier than Mitch. So, you know, he's, he's a good upgrade to their offense or a good, you know, kind of replacement to their offense. But yeah, I was, I didn't, you know, and I don't think they had to give up a lot. I like, I like Eric Swanson a lot. Um, I didn't like it that he always talked about North Dakota state football, but he was, he's a good dude. And I think he's pretty effective. But when you're probably, you know, he had kind of, I think they ran him pretty hard throughout the season and kind of got exposed a little bit on how much you can use him. And so I, I don't think like giving up, on, giving him up when he's arb eligible is the worst thing in the world. When the, and the part of the reason is, is because the Mariners believe they can, they can really develop relievers or build relievers and build pitchers. They're really, they think they can do that. I mean, they, you know, they had success with Seawald. I mean, Swanson was a former starter and they've, they've done some things to tweak him. They think they've made him better. So I think they believe in their pitching guys and that they can build relievers. And don't be surprised if somebody like Bryce Miller or one of those young, young kids that's throwing 100 for double A is called up this year and added to the bullpen, similar to what they did with Diaz or with um, Brash and, you know, and go from there. Um, Michael's asking my favorite hand or memory. Or something that sums up his Mariners years. Hmm. Well, I mean, obviously the hit against the Angels was pretty cool. I, I just, and I kind of wrote this, and I think I mentioned it before, but like 
when Mitch first came here, I, I really was astonished by how seriously he treated every single thing that he did on the baseball field. You know, that first spring, he was so serious during batting practice and taking fly balls during batting practice. And he does it every day. Like he took fly balls off the bat almost every day. He worked, you know, he worked so hard and, and I, we used to, and he was so not good at interviews early. And we called him, I called him a cyborg. I think I wrote that he was a baseball cyborg, like half human, half robot. We don't know. We aren't sure what the percent or even part human, part robot, but we don't know what percentage he is actually human because he's just so intense. But like after he came back from that surgery, those surgeries and all that stuff, he was just a different guy in terms of he tried to enjoy being a baseball player as much. He was just as intense, but he smiled a little bit more, had a little bit more fun. And just like, I really just like talking with him about what, how he feels about preparing every day, how he feels about hitting all these things. He was a super nerd about hitting. It was, it was fun to listen to him talk. And, you know, those are kind of just BSing with him. I, I get, I get tired of like all of my guys that I, I get to be pretty, you know, have good relationship with to the point where they tell me stuff, honest stuff off the record. They're all gone anymore. You know, it was before it was Nelly Cruz and, and Felix on some level. And, and, um, Paxton was Paxton Zanino were great and Taiwan Walker, they're all gone. And then Seeger's gone now. And, and, and now it's, now it's Mitch. I mean, Ty France better be ready for me to be hanging out by his locker a lot. That's all I got to say. Is Colin wrong really that much of an upgrade over Adam Frazier? Uh, yeah, he, like, I think last year was an anomaly defensively. I think he's a better defensive second baseman than Frazier, but he can't, he didn't have positional versatility like Frazier. I know he's played some left field, um, but, and he, Wong's got a little bit more pop. You know, Frazier lost some bat to ball skills. I think when you're in your, when you're going to be a free agent the following year and you get off to a slow start or you're trying to put up numbers, because I mean, it matters. These guys, you know, that's their first real paycheck. I mean, you know, obviously their paychecks are still better than mine, but like when you, when you, when free agency is right there, you want to do well and you start off slow and you start pressing and, and Fraser admitted, he just got caught up in the fact that he got off to such a slow start in a way that he'd never done it before. And so he tried to do more and it just made it worse. And then when he started to hit, he just kind of stayed up the middle and, you know, he battled some, some minor injuries and stuff like that was out there all the time. But I think, you know, Wong's 32. Look, if they both play optimally, you know, if Wong returns to his, I wouldn't say his gold glove form, but like some form of it, I think he's still a better player than Frazier, but it's not significant. It's just that like, you know, they needed, they had a way to go get him. And I don't know that they want to go free agency route or bring back Frazier at this point. How's Evan White fit in the M's future? I don't, I honestly don't know how Evan White fits in the Mariners future. I don't know if he's even healthy now. Um, get complications from the hip ish, hip surgery, complications from the, the hernia surgery. Nothing felt right. Like we watched him run. It didn't look normal. You know, he would play. He would try and play hard. It would start to hurt both areas. So I think the Mariners are just hoping with some rest and some time that, you know, he gets back to where he, he was physically. But like now we're we're looking at, you know, he played 60 games in 2020 and he probably shouldn't even have played that many big league games. He struggled so much, but they didn't have anywhere to send him. He gets to 2021. He played to what about May, May 30th or May 15th. And he was hurt. And they didn't play. He barely played 25 or 30 minor league games this year. He needs volume, volume of games to play. I thought, you know, and talking with some people, they thought when he was healthy, the times he was healthy down in Tacoma, um, some of the swing stuff that he had done and kind of reverted back to it, it started to get him a better contact rate. He was hitting the ball harder again, um, all those things, but he just couldn't stay healthy. And so I think that was the the biggest issue. And I don't know, they they don't even know if he's how healthy he is right now. You know, uh, I talked to Japoto at the, the, the winter meetings he just says I don't know we won't know until he gets back on the field and it's not so much how you feel going into the workouts it's how you feel the next day 
and can you go again and again like they talk about it all the time is like you know can you post you know can you play the next day and you know that's the big thing and evan hasn't proven that and he still has to prove that he can hit so you know it's it's going to be a long road bat for him that's for sure who's better at catching who's a better catcher at calling a game cal raleigh or tom murphy i think um it's raleigh even though you know he hasn't been doing it as long a year ago i wouldn't have said cal raleigh um but you know now i would he just he took his level of commitment and he worked really hard i mean he's a coach's kid his dad was the coach at university of tennessee he was coach of western carolina um cal took like preparing for pitchers very seriously but i think he just has a better grasp that came with doing it a lot and being the guy and not having murphy there or anybody else to lean on you know murphy was hurt and you know you had terence who's not a good catcher not a good at calling games and not a traditional catcher because he was an infielder that was converted so i think he was kind of forced to get better and he understood that was important and i think honestly once he got more comfortable with that and got that into his routine, I think it helped his offense a little bit too. I think he just was so stressed about the the game calling and then trying to fit it all in. Once you get better at the game calling and your preparation, you figure out how to do it. And you just have a, a larger number of games under your belt. Um, that makes a huge difference and allowed him to have a better routine on, um, on, uh, on every day to be a better player. So I, I really like Cal. He's, good kid and i mean tough like you should have seen so like he showed me his thumb after like like because he would hide it like he wouldn't let you see his thumb those last weeks of the season and after that last game he showed it to me it was disgusting and it was just purple and swollen and like how much respect to that guy because think about that like Luis Luis Castillo's thrown 98 miles per hour sinkers and you saw the the tweets from pitching ninja the run on those things and he you know that's the hardest pitch in baseball is to catch that thing. And it's coming down. I mean, for him to do that, he is one tough hombre. I got much respect to Cal Raleigh for that. Uh, ben saying the Jose Abreu to Houston doesn't help. Uh, no, definitely not. It, no, it does not. Um, That's a big move. Yeah. And, and it was like, it was smart for Abreu in a lot of ways too. Like, you know, he's not going there and you don't have to carry everybody. He goes there, you know, he plays first, he DHs. It's unbelievable hitters park for right-handed hitters. I mean, it's it's almost kind of a joke. Um, but yeah, it's you know, the big thing with him too is staying healthy. And, you know, I think being able to DH him a lot will help him. Um, but yeah, that's I mean, like the big plan of the the step back when Jerry and those guys started, it was the idea that the, the Astros were going to start to age and lose players to free agency and, and start to take some regression. But I don't know. Didn't see any regression from those guys this year. I mean, they were, they were really, really good. And, you know, they don't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. Somebody says, Ryan, I'm a Cleveland fan. I would like to hear your opinion of, of his Oh, his defense. Oh, Zanino's defense. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know where he's at physically. Um, and he's, he's gotten older. He's a big dude. So I don't know that he's as mobile behind the plate as maybe he was, you know, when he was here in Seattle, he was really good and physical and strong. Um, but I think he's, he's still really solid. And he's great at calling a game and pitchers trust him. And, um, and that's big. Like, you know, you, you have to get pitchers trust. I, that's one of the reasons why you look at Tampa, Tampa cares so much about their pitching. And that's why they love Zanino is because their pitchers love Zanino and he put in all the work and they believed the pitchers believe he made them better. And whether he did or not, if the pitchers believe that, then you want that. And a lot of the numbers um, showed it. So offensively he's going to hit 210 and hit a whole bunch of homers that's what he does he'll strike out a bunch he'll strike out at a 35 percent rate he'll hit a bunch of homers and if he puts the barrel on the ball it's going to come off you know close to 100 miles an hour but it just the contact will always be an issue with z um, and like i said you've started to see a lot of the injuries start to build up with catchers and 
And I think he'll still be very effective. And I think one thing is too, he is a veteran. He's an older guy for what is one of the youngest lineups in baseball. Um, he'll be a good presence there. And I think, you know, for some of their pitching, he'll be really good. I, I think that, you know, McKenzie and, and, and Bieber and those guys are really going to like him. Um, I know that talking with Blake Snell when he was in San Diego, he missed Zanino every day, you know, pitching for San Diego. So probably didn't miss the stadium's difference between San Diego and Tampa. Um, will Marco Gonzalez get back to form? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I guess I don't know. You know, he's he's basically a number five. You know, the, the years where he, you know, it was a 2019, he was really solid. He had a little more velocity, a little more movement. I think with Marco is though, he, he continues to work. So like he's going to come in in good shape and he'll have worked on maybe find a little bit more, more command with his cutter or a little more movement. You know, I don't think he's ever going to get back to throwing 91 or 92. Um, but that's not how, you know, and even if he did, I don't know that he would be able to command in a way that would allow him to have success. I mean, if you're looking at him as the number five guy on your rotation, yeah, he's about where you want. Basically, you just want him to take the ball every fifth day. And that's, you know, that's what's crazy is like they did not have a starter miss a start due to injury last year. You know, whether once they swapped out Brash for Kirby and yeah, they they did a bullpen start to protect Kirby's innings, but none of those starters suffered an injury, which is pretty rare. And you wonder if it's going to last this season. I, the odds say no. But I think with Marco is just about, you know, take the ball every fifth day, keep him in games. You know, and for the most part, he'll do that. You know, there are just going to be some games where it's going to be really ugly. He's going to get hit. Um, teams have sort of figured him out. And it's just kind of his, he's got to execute that day. And if he doesn't have it, it could, he'll get hit. But, you know, and he might not be around. You never know. They could trade him. I mean, like, I don't, I don't think, I know that they won't, I, well, I'd be stunned if they had both Chris Flexen and Marco Gonzalez on the opening day roster. One of them will likely be traded. I mean, they tr they tried to train Marco at the deadline um, to the Phillies. So, you know, that's that's a possibility for certain. I mean, Flexen was crying in the locker room after the last game against the Astros because he believed he wouldn't be back this year. And he was so close with Marco and, and – Robbie and gotten to be friends with like France and all these guys that he was about leaving because he figured like he'd be he'd be gone. Um Alex says Gonzalez is a six starter. Well, maybe on some rotations, but right now he's the fifth. Um uh, Philip asks, isn't Chris Flexen? Sorry, I don't have my reading glasses on. I look like an idiot when I put them on, so I'm kind of isn't Chris Flexen at $8 million next year a really attractive trade trip in this pitching market? Yes. Yes, he's very attractive. And I think he is uh, I think he is trying to uh, – I think the Mariners have every desire to trade him for something, whether it is to get that left fielder, a right-handed hitting left fielder. You know, um, I think they would do that. You're right. Like $8 million is very cheap. I'm I'm still stunned at what Taiwan Walker got versus, you know, this year. I mean, like if you look at it and you break down some of the the pitches and everything else, I mean, there are a lot of similarities between Flexen and Taiwan. And Taiwan got four years, what, 72 million? Like, holy moly. Um, so yeah, I think they'll trade him, especially like as we get closer to spring training teams are going to look at their rotation depth and say, Oh my goodness, this isn't, this isn't what we want. You know, we need to get another guy here. And that's when they, they kind of pounce, but I do know though, they, they've been shopping him. They shopped him at the deadline. They had a lot of offers at the deadline, but they were also a little concerned with Kirby's innings and they didn't want to, you know, they were just worried about if something were to happen and have a starter get injured in the stretch run, they just, they didn't want that that they didn't want to have to go down to AAA where they didn't really have a starter ready. I mean, the next best starter would have been Taylor Dollar probably who was at AA and, and they just didn't want to do that. Um, okay. Anything else? Oh, I thought I saw a Sean Figgins question here. Maybe not. Uh, well. The Yankees could use Flexen. Yeah, Yankees could use just about anybody at this point, I think. 
Um, I'm kind of curious to see what they'll do. We've been very, very unYankee like at times in this this market. You know, I don't. I'm I'm surprised we haven't got any questions about the shortstop thing. But I think I answered that last year about JP and why they kept him at shortstop. But I the Mariners. So like, there was some consternation when Depoto went on seven ten and said like, uh, said that he they didn't have any meetings really at the uh, winter meetings. Well, they didn't have any face to face meetings. They, I mean, like Depoto's Depoto's cell phone goes off more than fourteen year old girl or fifteen year old girl. Like he's gone there all the time. Um, so I, a lot of the communication is done by a text. They had met with the agents. Um, I think there's only two for the four shortstops because I think it's Casey Close for one of them and Scott Boris for the other three. They'd met with all the shortstop agents from the very beginning. And they were kind of told by all of them that they were expecting 10-year contracts for all those guys. <laughs> Even I don't know that Swanson was expecting it, but you know, was hoping for it. And the Mariners were just like, that's probably not gonna happen. You know, and I don't know. Part of the reason I think is, is one, not only would the Mariners have to give 10 years, but they just would have to pay a little bit more than they're willing to pay in the sense that, you know, they're not attracted to coming to Seattle, honestly. I mean, Trey Turner, like Trey Turner gave up $40 million, $60 million or whatever it was to go because he wanted to be on the East Coast. Everybody knew that, you know, while for a while Turner said he didn't, that wasn't the case. His agent was telling people, look, he wants to play on the East Coast or play for the Dodgers. Those were the two options. You know, he wanted to live in Florida during spring training because that's where he lives at. So, you know, the Mariners could offer him. I guess if the Mariners offered $400 million, maybe he might have. But, like, that's a 10-year deal. He's going to be 42 at the end of it. Um, you know, and, I mean, like, think about this. If the Mariners didn't trade Cano, he'd be still on the Mariners right now. Well, sort of. I mean, they'd probably release him, but they'd still be paying the $24 million. Um, And then the other ones, I, I just – don't think, you know, Correa, I, Correa, I guess if you just gave him 350 million, Correa would probably sign with you, but I still don't think the Mariners don't want to do it. I, I still know, I know that they want to make a run at Shohei Otani next year. I don't know how much that's going to cost. Every team should want to make a run at Shohei, but I know that that's something that they want to make a run at. So maybe like throwing 300 million at a player you don't necessarily love was not something they wanted to do. Um, you know, JP's got a lot of work to do. His swing is really bad and it's really long. And he ran out of gas and he was dinged up last year towards the end. So we'll be interested to see what he does, um, you know, this year. But I don't, you know, unless Dansby Swanson suddenly doesn't have a market and the Mariners can get him for what they believe is below market value. I just don't think that that's going to happen. And I don't think, I think the twins are perfectly willing to give the 300 million to Correa that some teams aren't including the Yankees. It seems like, um, who are some of the minor league players who might make the team? <laughs> I don't see any position players because they just, I mean, if you looked at the triple a roster last year, it was all kind of retreads other than Kelnick, you know, when Tramel was down there. Um, it was all mostly kind of retreads and and guys like minor league free agents that they signed to fill out the team you know, with some big league experience. So I don't see any of those guys. You know, I don't know that. Um, I don't know that anybody would make the team out of spring training. Like maybe I said Bryce Miller. I'm trying to think of who the other names. There, there's a bunch of guys that throw really hard down a double A maybe they could pull a stunner and make the team. I, I think the Mariners are in a position where they don't need a minor leaguer to try and surprise them and make the team. If it happens, great. But I don't, you know, I think ideally for the Mariners, they have the team they want in place largely. And, you know, they'll be able to just kind of, you know, especially if they add the the outfield bat or whatever they want to do or supplement in the weeks leading up to it, they'll, that that's the team they'll go with. So they won't be asking a, an unproven kid to come in and play um, meaningful games for a team trying to, you know, compete for the division or make the postseason, um, unless that kid is so dominant that they believe he could be a game changer. 
Steve asks, rule changes, how will they affect the M's next year? Well, Diego Castillo is going to have some trouble with the old uh, pitch clock. Um, he mm-hmm. he does not work fast. You know, and also Marco, for all the stuff, like Mar- when Marco has runners on base, he gets super deliberate. Like when he's pitching out, like nobody on base, he works really fast. But sometimes when runners get on base, he gets super deliberate. That could be a problem. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Castillo, man, like I, I get mad at him. He has that whole little thing. If you notice it, there's a little routine. Shirt, I think it's pants. Shirt, pull on the thing, pull your hat down, slap the glove, and go. And it's like that's you're just not gonna be able to do that. Um, the base, the bases, and the lack, you know, the limited pickoff throws. Yeah, I think that helps Sam Haggerty and Dylan Moore. They draw a lot of pickoff throws, anyways. I mean. Should they increase and the bigger bags? Should they increase stolen bases? Yeah, I mean, you know, Cade Marlowe, who stole thirty some bags, is a plus runner, but he's not a traditionally great base stealer. He benefited a lot by those rules. So yeah, I think should be better stolen base wise. Um, as far as the shifting goes, I me, mean, you can still have guys on the right by second base. You know, just can't be on the other side of it. They have to be on the dirt. So it, it does help Cal Raleigh and probably Kelnick, you know, the, the balls that they hit to second base, but the second baseman is 25 feet deep on the outfield grass. Those probably get through, especially if the second baseman isn't rangy. And so that probably helps them a ton. Those two guys, um, you know, they get more hits. I mean, if Kyle Seager was still playing, it'd help him a ton. But that, I think that's the biggest um that biggest uh, effect on the rule changes, at least for me, I am curious. I I've watched some, some Rainier's games with a pitch clock and it is, it is super nice. It just, it goes, it's, I think if you guys have been to games with pitch clocks and watched it, it's pretty amazing how quick the, the pace of the game is, which is always makes me happy because I complain about how slow games go. Um, what's the current prediction for tw- 2023 win total? Hmm. You know, they don't have to play the Astros as much this year, which is probably a good thing. Um, they won nine. Well, I have a hard time. Like right now with what they have, I have a hard time seeing more than 90 wins because I think that their pitching staff, there it just there's no way it can stay as healthy as it does. I'm not saying I want them or expect them. I just think that, baseball history and baseball laws say that pitchers tend to wear down and when they get used a lot the next year is usually when the injuries start to to pop up so i yeah i must i'll say 89 wins right now as constructed now if they go get you know if they go get a couple guys um or if they get one more guy that's like a real significant upgrade yeah i could see 90 i mean i could see that guy being a two to three win player um you know, and I mean, like they may do something at the deadline too, like they did this year. I don't know that it'll be the Luis, uh, Luis Castillo type. I guess you'll have a whole year of Castillo, but I'll be very interested to see what Robbie Ray looks like next year. If he's comes in, changed up anything or anything like that. And then also just very aware of what, and the Mariners are very aware of what Kirby did last year. I mean, he pitched so many more innings than he did. Um, you know, an eighth point in his career, what will the effects be? Will he just be fine? Will he be normal? Um, Or will, you know, will he fatigue at times? You know, he did miss in 21. He missed a month due to shoulder fatigue. And even at the um, alternate training site, he dealt with shoulder fatigue. Now the Mariners have said that they cleaned up something mechanically that helped alleviate that, but you just don't know what to expect. I think Logan Gilbert should be fine. He he's, you know, his progression was a little more normal, but it's hard to say, you know, and Robbie's not young. So I think that's, if, if one of those guys misses a month, that's what's going to keep them from being like a 95 win team is if the, any attrition to the pitching staff. Are the, uh, Michael, uh, Matthew asked, are the 23 Mariners, will the 23 Mariners be a better team on paper at least? 
than the 22 team. Huh. Um, yeah, I think so. Because, like, you know, going into 22 at the start of the season, we didn't really know how that fifth starter was going to work. You know, you knew it was probably going to be either Brash or, or Kirby, but we didn't know what you were going to get out of those guys, especially with the innings limit that they were going to put on them. So, yeah, I didn't really know there. Obviously, I thought Winker was going to be better, and I didn't think Suarez was going to be that much of a game changer, and he was outstanding. Um, and maybe you wonder if he's going to have a little bit of a regression either. I I think the 23 Mariners are are better on paper um, just because of you look at your pitching staff now. Robbie Ray was was still a decent pitcher during the regular season. So you're rolling out a starting rotation, you know, of Castillo, Ray, Kirby, Gilbert, and then, you know, probably Marco. That's still a pretty good rotation that, and, and then you still have a bullpen that features Seawald, you know, Brash, Andres Munoz, um, you know, Moon, no, we, nobody knew what to expect from Munoz this year. So I think you look at what they have now um, means that, you know, they they're probably better. Uh, this is higher expectations, though. I mean, what teams mean? Uh, yeah, I mean, like they're. I mean, the expectations were high last year. They finally came out and said, "Hey, look, it's our goal to win, make the playoffs." Like they rarely did that. They always say, "Oh yeah, we want to make the playoffs," but like last year, they just said, and maybe a big part of it was Hanniger being willing to say it first. But they said, "Look, the goal is this year is to." to well Hanniger said to win the world series but to do that you have to make the playoffs and they were tired of the drought and they wanted to end it so yeah i think there are even increased expectations but like when you come out and lay down like a finite or like you lay down a specific goal that's win related or whatever that sets you up to like if you don't reach it to be considered a failure and so i think that they put a lot of pressure on there and this year they just said they want to be better than they were last year which is kind of nebulous, but I mean, like, again, the players will come out and say something totally different. That's that really pissed off the players a couple of years ago, even going into 21, you know, in the off season going into 21 that or 22 that, you know, they just still talked about getting better and they wouldn't say that stuff. Whereas like, you know, going into 21, I mean, they didn't, the Mariners going into 2021, the Mariners players didn't feel like the, the organization did enough to make the team better. And realistically they didn't, they didn't, want to give Colton Wong the extra year on the contract that they offered him when the Brewers came back, you know, they didn't want to match the Brewers or even make it better. You know, they wouldn't give Taiwan Walker the extra year uh, that he was asking for only offered a one year. And then they pulled it early. Like, you know, they were told that they weren't allowed to spend Kevin Mather, as we remember said that he on a zoom call. So I should be making sure I say, but he's Mather said, you know, that they were trying to have free agents come hat in hand. That was their philosophy. And it didn't work and players were frustrated and they felt like, you know, it was another year of like rebuilding and hearing about just getting better and gaining experience. Well, guys like Marco and Seeger and JP and all those guys said, no, we don't, we don't subscribe to that. We play to win. We play to win every day. We believe we can win and make the postseason this year. And they damn near did it. So, you know, that's, that's the difference, I think. And I don't even know where this rambling tangent is going anymore, but they, the expectations players always accept the expectations higher than what the, you know, what like guys like service or depot are going to willingly say, because again, like when you're the GM, if you put a specific goal out there and you don't reach it, then you can say, well, people are like, well, you didn't reach it. You failed. Why do we have you? So it's a lot easier for them to, you know, for leadership to put a nebulous goal on something, um until you know you feel like you're really close i mean like this is the first time where i've heard people say the world series you know hollander said it now depoto said it but it really does feel like mitch said it first you know like he was the first one willing to come out and say it and i think he forced everyone else to start talking about it in a way that you know they had to keep going and and push forward all right so we we just crossed the hour threshold here are there any last questions we could probably do a couple more if people have anything they haven't yet had a chance to ask okay i don't see any haven't heard anything ryan uh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> Jim, Bill Woodward. i was i was fiddling with the mute um more an observation and uh then you 
can comment on the implications, Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, at least in the section we were sitting in the 18 inning final game of the season, uh, the reporters in several different venues uh, kept talking about how the fans stayed on and kept chanting, let's go Mariners. But the chant where we were was, thank you, Mariners. Um, I mean, it was very clear where we were. And I was a little frustrated that uh, the people who heard the chant didn't pick it up. Uh, there was almost a similar feeling that I had in 1995 when the fans didn't want to leave. This was a rewarding season from the standpoint of a lot of fans. How do you read fan expectations and fan support in 2023 is the, is the implication question. <laughs> well, um, since my Twitter mentions during the winter meetings look like Lord of the Flies, um, and I think that the expectations are pretty high. I mean, what, what has happened, and, and I think you guys all know this, is that the Mariners' success, and coupled with what was supposed to be the expected uh, rough season of, of the Seahawks, we just got a lot of a lot more. There was a lot more casual Mariners fans that really got serious about it when they got good. So you're you're hearing from different fans now than maybe you'd hear when even a year ago. And so when I think that the the end of 2021 really changed the perception of this team and the organization in terms of okay now yeah you guys got to do your little rebuild and and we saw what you, this. You saw what we're like. The fans saw, you know, the fans show what they can be like when you put a good product on the field. And so they're like, no, no, we're not doing rebuild anymore. It's time to go. And I think the Mariners recognized it for the most part. But again, like, I don't even know if they know how like serious it is. And I'm not going to use, um, I'm not going to use the lunatic fringe that can find yourself in Twitter because it really is. It's a vocal, it's a very vocal, 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 vocal um, section of a fan base. And it's not a huge one, but I do think that like, you know, just seeing people's frustrations about the Mariners not adding pieces of this off season as, and I just try to explain them like they were never going to get Aaron judge. They were never going to get Trey Turner. They just wasn't, those weren't options. I mean, like the realistic aspect of it is, is like not everybody is available to you, you know, like, you know, I think I used the analogy once on the radio is like, not everybody gets to ask the prom queen to the prom, you know, like you just know your place, you don't get to do it. So um, I, I just think that we're hearing more and more. And I know like with emails and stuff and like even DePoto talking about payroll the other day, there is, there is a sense that like go, like they want them to go like, you know, you're, you're driving down the road and you see where you want to go and they want them to step on the gas. And they I mean, like not step on like Florida and get to where it goes. Um, and, and I don't think, you know, I think um, that's, I think that's good, honestly, like, you know, either be real, you know, like either fans are really interested, like in two ways, either they're really pissed off about what you're doing and hate everything that you're doing and frustrated and being vocal or, they're really excited and that's all they care about. Like, but when nobody cares and like they're indifferent, that's not where you want to be. And, and I think that's, that's a big thing for the Mariners is like, they have kind of, and we know this, I mean, I mean, Bill, you've been there. There's no better place to be on a, on a Sunday afternoon or a Friday evening when it's 80 degrees out than T-Mobile park I mean, like, it's the best place to be in Seattle those days. And I think people are realizing that when it's good baseball that you're going to see, that's even more important. So I think that's what I, th I, I know that, like, the numbers on our readership during the postseason and even on the stuff that I wrote at the winter meetings, and I'm sure they're probably mad I haven't written more of late, um, is – is off the chart right now and the speculation, you know, and, and that's kind of the thing about the hot stove is, is like, people just want to know more. Like we all, you know, everybody's just like the, you know, it's like college football recruiting or whatever, like the potential, the idea of potential. It's like, who can you add? And what could this be? And you, it gives you something to talk about. And the Mariners are still getting talked about in a time when like in years past where 
people were just didn't care, you know. So I'm, I I think it was it was really it was really kind of an important season for the Mariners as an organization, um, but like also just for it was cool to see like T-Mobile like that, you know. When I was an intern in 2000 for the News Tribune, I came I was I came out here and I was at the first game when A Rod came back. You know, and I came out in 2001 and went to a game like it was just so crazy to see all that stuff. Or it's 2001, I'm sorry, when a came back. But like 2000, you know, as an intern, I, the stadium was full and that's what I remembered. So to see what it was like before is, is difficult. So it was cool. It's, it's really there's a buy in right now. And like you said, the thank you aspect, like people didn't want to leave, you know. It was like I, I remember. I have friends, even friends back home in Montana that aren't necessarily Mariners fans, but they just got so caught up in watching every day for them to clinch and then the postseason. Like, like what are we gonna do? Like, I don't because I, I don't get to watch the Mariners today. Like, I, I don't want to watch the playoffs. I just wanted to watch the Mariners. I like this team, and I think that that's what that's what's kind of permeated around the fan base. It's just everybody was they couldn't believe there was a day without a game, without a Mariners game, anyways. Ryan, thank you for taking the time with us this evening and uh, spending hour plus working through our questions. It's always a pleasure to have you. We'll look forward to having you again in 2023. Um, everybody else, thank you for joining us. We had, I think, 26 in attendance at one point uh, this evening and almost everybody stuck on to the end here. Thank you all. We'll be in touch uh, with announcements for future meetings. Uh, hope everyone has a safe, and healthy uh, holiday season and new year. And we'll be in touch uh, down the road. Thank you all. Thanks guys. Take it easy. Thanks, Pip. Thanks, Brian. Good job. Thanks, all. Thanks.